Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Concurrency, the New Era of Supply Chain Planning. I'm your host, Melissa Clow. In this webcast, we will hear how leading organizations are abandoning outdated, overly rigid supply chain planning processes and moving towards the future of planning, concurrency. But before I hand controls over to, the, to today's speakers, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover. First, we are recording today's session. Everyone on the call will receive an email in the next day or so with a link to the recording of the webcast, as well as the PowerPoint slides. These will be sent to the email address that you use to register for the webcast. We'll also post these slides to the resource center of our website, canaxis.com. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to submit your questions that you might have for the presenters in the Q&A window on the right-hand side of your screen. We have set aside time for the Q&A and we'll answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Should you encounter any technical issues, please use the chat window and I will do my best to assist you. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Trevor Miles, Vice President of Thought Leadership at Canaxis. Trevor, let's get things started. Thank you very much, Melissa, and good afternoon to, and good morning, and good evening to whomever is on the, the webinar from whichever part of the world. Welcome, and uh, we really would like to introduce Kevin and Mara. Uh, who would be the major speaker during this uh, session. Kevin is Head of Research at SEM World, which is a garden and practitioner community of senior supply chain executives. Prior to joining SEM World in 2012, he was Group Vice President of Supply Chain at Gartner following the 2010 acquisition of AMR Research, where he was the Chief Strategy Officer. Kevin was the uh, creator of the Gartner's Top 25 Supply Chain and author of Supply Chain Saves the World, as well as over 1,000 articles published in journals, including Business Week, Forbes, and the Financial Times, amongst others. Kevin is a graduate of uh, Boston College, Oxford University, and Stanford Business School, where he has also dedicated a lot of time to improving supply chain education, having served on advisory boards of the University of Tennessee, the University of Wisconsin, and APEX. So Kevin is definitely qualified and understands planning and supply chain very well. And with that, Kevin, welcome, and uh, please take it away. Trevor and Melissa, both thanks for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I see we have quite a few people on the line, which is always satisfying. I'm going to start off talking about digital, and the reason I'm going to do that is it's an extremely disruptive force. When we spend our time out there today with the base talking about what strategic issues are important, digital comes top of mind, and I'll circle back to concurrency and the future of planning because you'll see how much digital affects that. Let me open with a little bit of data. What you see here, a series of bar charts, represents survey responses to over a thousand individuals in each of the last three years, 2014, 2014, 2014, 2015, and 2016. And as you can see, we are asking really a very simple question. I'll tell you what the question exact wording is. For each of the categories of technology, which do you consider disruptive and important, uh, interesting but of unclear usefulness, or third, irrelevant? Now, we asked this question first in 2014, and we offered up these buckets that you see here, big data analytics, digital supply chain, Internet of Things, and so forth. The takeaway for me is, number one, that they have all grown, and in fact, pretty substantially, especially if you look at the right-hand side of the chart. Drones, sharing economy, 3D printing, these kinds of operational technologies have radically jumped. But look on the left, and you'll see the stuff that really sinks back up to what we're going to talk about today, which is concurrency. Uh, big data analytics, one of the really, truly disruptive technologies out there, and I think fundamental to understanding where this future of planning goes because the power of processing that has evolved in recent years and the ability to digest massive amounts of data is something really new in the way we're going to be thinking about planning. And I think cloud is another one that's important to call out. You see both have risen substantially since 2014, when in fact they were already among the more important um, 
categories of disruptive technology. These issues that are presented by the presence of all of this pretty significantly affect the way that we think about planning. And let me get into a little bit of that. The question I'm asking here when I think about technology and I think about the way things are, um, with these digital disruptors, are we seeing the end of sales and operations planning? I mean, I personally have got a bit of a harsh view on SNOP. I feel like a lot of time goes into it. We've done some work on how many hours of preparation go into your typical SNOP meeting, and it's quite a bit. We have to ask ourselves, with all these dis digital disruptions and all these changes in the tools that are available to us, not to mention the changes in the environment in which we have to work, are we looking at a time where SNOP has to be rethought? The reason we ask this question, you can see it here in this chart. It's a very simple chart, but I think it really gets at the crux of the issue about why we're talking about a change in planning. If you look on the vertical axis here, you see high frequency, low frequency. And that implies simply that we do it often, always, daily, periodically, weekly, whatever that's high frequency. Low frequency would be annual or um, quarterly at best. And then in terms of impact, think about the time horizon planning challenge, and not just in terms of how often we do it, but how impactful it is to the business. Obviously, low frequency, low impact seems a bit like it's not worth doing. But what we find ourselves stuck with is we can either afford to take the time to do high frequency planning, but have it fairly siloed within a production environment, for instance, short-term production planning, or within a warehouse um, planning fulfillment activities for the day, or work planning at a local uh, level, or forecasting, let's say, in a particular channel or a particular customer. That can be done fairly frequently, but it's limited low impact. If you go to the bottom right, what you look at is high impact, low frequency. The kind of truly integrated thinking that can really change your strategic position in the business, all your channel alternatives, all your product alternatives, all your sourcing alternatives, all your time horizons on the table at once trying to think about what you can do, that takes a lot of time. If you really turn back the clock, pull out of SNOP and pull up to strategic planning, this begins to approximate the traditional annual strategic planning cycle that companies have done for decades. But the problem, you see, is you're stuck with one of two choices. It's kind of a lesser of two evils. Lots of high-frequency, low-impact, short-term planning, or a little bit of very high-impact, low-frequency, long-term planning. That's not really ideal, and that question mark points to where we want to go. How do we break this organization reality, that we can afford to do high frequency, low impact planning provided it's distributed and siloed, or we can afford to do centralized and hierarchical planning, truly large scale strategic planning, and have it be high impact provided it's low frequency. That's kind of the crux of the issue. And SNOP, which in some ways promises to do a little bit of both, execution level, but also strategic, is stuck. And that's where we find ourselves. We've gathered data on this question of sales and operations planning and how well it works. This is from 2015 survey, so this is just over a year old. We asked in this question about um, your views for the respondent base, again, the SCM World Community of Practitioners. And if you see the bottom right, 1,008 individuals responded. What they think about the current SNOP or IDP process as it stands today. And we gave them a few different ways of looking at it. At the top, you see your overall feelings about the SNOP process as a whole. That comes in the highest, if you like, in terms of satisfaction. 58% say they consider it effective and impactful. Um, and you see the rest of the color coding here, those who call it a necessary evil, or those who see no value at all, or those who literally say it does not exist. So SNOP is out there. 6% say it doesn't exist. That means effectively everybody's doing it but 31% consider it a necessary evil. In other words, they don't like it. It's not great. But as you come down the cascade here, it gets worse. So executive SNOP is slightly less loved than the overall process. The follow through, even still a little bit less loved. The preparation, you see 42% say it's a necessary evil. That's really not a big surprise when the preparation is constituted by spreadsheets, Word documents, telephone calls, PowerPoints, classic old school siloed disconnected information systems. That's a lot of work. 
But the bottom one is the one I want to call your attention to, because this really caught my eye when the data first came in. FNOP is out there, everybody's doing it, and yet 18% of these respondents, that's 180 people, 181 actually, said that they have no technology support, no enabling technology for sales and operations planning. That's far from ideal. And I think in the light of what we see about digital disruptions and some of these technologies that are working their way into the way we do business, the fact that nearly one in five answer this question by saying they have no enabling technology, that really gets at the crux of the issue, which is that two-by-two two matrix I showed you a moment ago, high frequency but low impact, or low frequency but high impact, it's really not ideal. And I think the technology gap is something that we're in a position to begin to address. There's a quote that comes from a guy I've known for a long time, this fellow Jake Barr. Worked at Procter & Gamble for most of his career. He's out independently right now. But he makes this statement, which I think really gets at the sort of scale of the opportunity of bringing this notion of concurrency into what has been uh, the realm of SNOP. He says, a decision you need to make right now could easily have long-term implications. In other words, it may be short-term, it may be high frequency, but you might make a decision with the way you handle a certain customer or a particular purchase or a particular uh, delivery transaction and set a precedent or set a ball rolling that has long-term implications. The connectivity of what we do out there in the supply chain and how it affects our appearance as a business or our reputation, or if you start including the risk questions, um, how much of a potential impact that has on brand equity or even potentially liability. You might make short-term decisions that you really regret in the long term. So we can't really separate these two, strategic planning for the long horizon with lots of effort, separate from uh, tactical, siloed, local, high-frequency planning. Those two somehow have to come together. So is it possible, and that's really the simplest concept of all, is how do we take what we have in the as-is, let's call it the before, these distributed siloed planning um, realities, and these separately organized centralized and hierarchical planning realities, can we go from that to something that looks a little bit more like this? Now the premise of this webinar, the premise of this research really is that the answer is yes, we can. Partially because we need to, because the competitive dynamic is changing, but partially because we can. The technology is changing. We're shifting into a different way of thinking about planning. More people involved, more democratized, more connected, more aware of other activities, more networked, and some kind of a hybrid of distributed close to the action and centralized with a view of the entire uh, strategic question. This is where we want to try to get to. And I'm going to talk about Honeywell first as an example. Honeywell's been at this planning question for a long time, and I think the organizational breakdown that I talked about on that first two-by-two two matrix is in some ways what's really most interesting. What Honeywell is trying to do is say, we want to include everybody in the planning discussion. The centralized planning, that strategic layer of planning, continues. And it encompasses a broad view of the entire business, of the entire company. But the decentralized planning at a plant level, at a field service group level, at a warehouse or distribution center level, is also something that really captures reality. So what Honeywell's in the process of doing is saying, you know what, we can increasingly afford, because of the tools around big data analytics and because of the access provided by cloud, to really democratize this process, <clears throat> to run both a centralized and a decentralized process, but provide analytics for everybody. So it's really a different way of thinking about things. The idea simply is we're not going to be afraid of huge amounts of data because we're not going to necessarily rely on Excel spreadsheets to get the work done. It's a breakthrough logic. It depends on the technology, but it also depends on an appetite to change the way that the planning is done. So let's talk about the future of planning. If Honeywell's trying to go down this road, organizing themselves accordingly, looking at the tools that are out there to, uh, to enable this kind of democratized planning, we want to look at it this way. And there's a report, by the way, that I'll tell you about when I get to the last slide, which uh, details all of this. 
This concept of concurrency is, is a really interesting way of thinking about how to get the most of, best of both worlds. If you look at the three big circles here representing this picture, we've got simulation. I've talked about that very briefly. Um, but that's really where the power of a complex model with massive amounts of data representing some combination of actuals and assumptions about the relationships between those actuals, so a giant math model, democratized decision making, which I've talked about organizationally, and Honeywell's an example of someone who's attempting that, and then include the last thing, which I haven't spoken about much yet, this historian bucket, and you begin to get at what concurrency is all about. If I want to have everybody involved, democratized, and I want to constantly be able to ask the what-if questions of a simulation, I'm going to have to keep track of what I learned. The historian is really the live cache of everything we've learned in the process of engaging all of these different players from the senior most um, top of the mountain view of the world to the most execution-oriented players out there in the field, and everybody asking a bunch of what-if questions got to be able to somehow collect and learn from what's happened in each one of those iterations of a planning, of a what if, bearing in mind that the planning and the execution increasingly collapse here. And whatever plan you come up with, whatever decisions you've made, whatever simulation that led you there, whatever decision-making process led you there, you get a chance to see how it worked out. The historian captures all of that process. So again, follow this chart. The overlap between the historian and the simulation, which is at the top of this chart where the Venn diagram has two uh, interlocking components, is cause and effect. You're able to understand what you did, why you thought it would work, how the decision was made, who was involved in it, and then see, did it work out? So the linkage between an assumption and an outcome, a decision and a result, is baked into that concept of cause and effect. You're not just planning and then moving on to actuals. If you take a look at where simulation intersects with democratized decision making, you get into something else that I think is extremely important around this concept. It's perpetual collaboration. It's constant decision making, constant new information, constant new challenges. And all the players encompassed in this democratized decision making ball, which really implies everybody has a hand in the process, they're constantly able to do what if scenarios, constantly be able being able to engage other players and say, you know what, if we ship this um, particular shipment to you unfinished and you did the finished work in a local uh, micro DC, for instance, how did it work out? We're solve solving problems together, and that's the collaborative principle that's really always been popular in supply chain, but very hard to connect back to decision making. There's an attitude that's pro-collaboration but it's not really as systematic and analytical as it could be. This becomes possible with this notion of democratized decision making interacting with simulation. And the last piece of the interactions I'm going to talk about before getting to the dead center of the concurrency piece is historian as it interacts with democratized decision making. Clout and waiting. <clears throat> Think of this as um, essentially scoring the relevance of, a, of an expert participant in the decision-making process. Everybody's out there, democratized decision-making, offering their thoughts, offering their suggestions, their um, concerns, their assumptions, their challenges. And some are going to be right more often than others. Certain individuals are going to become extremely good at knowing how to solve a problem, what kind of a, what kind of a promise is most deliverable, and how we're going to get the best performance in terms of, you name it, service level, profitability, um, cost. The historian keeps track of who's good at uh, playing this game. And the waiting reflects essentially those who are good at it have more clout. What you really want to be able to do is have a system in which this constant learning process, all three of these circles interacting constantly, um, takes advantage of differential experience, differential expertise, and maybe even just a good instinct that certain individuals bring to the party. But that clout and waiting intersection means that it's democratized, and yet it's capable of learning from the best. The center of all of this is concurrency. So if you think of concurrency as a successor to the concept of sales and operations planning, it is a successor because it allows you to 
do the rich simulation, the what if. It allows you to engage all the parties, not just those who are at the strategic planning table or out there in the field in their local production planning situation. And it keeps track of everything that's happened, constantly learning. You can almost imagine these wheels spinning ever more quickly. This is what concurrency is all about. Now, I'm going to talk about Cisco for a second, in part because Cisco, I've known Cisco for a very long time. They've been a very active uh, experimenter with advanced approaches to planning. And they've used a lot of tools and a lot of different tactics, certainly no stranger to SNOP or IBP. But what's exciting about Cisco is their supply chain strategies, forget about planning for a sec, but the actual strategies applied to their structure and attack within supply chains include things like Segmented supply chains, pretty common these days. It's a very powerful way of getting more out of what you've got. Customer collaboration, another um, explicit supply chain strategy they've got to try to get more demand information from the customer back up into the system and collaborate on problem solving. And risk or resilience to disruption. Cisco was one of the founders of the Supply Chain Risk Leadership Council and has been at the front edge of this for a long time. All of those things involve more than just trying to balance supply and demand. They involve trade-offs. They involve alternate seg uh, paths to market. They involve um, choices from customers that pull back and influence the way that uh, the supply chain thinks about fulfilling an order or making a promise or expediting. So what Cisco is trying to do is support these kinds of strategies, relatively sophisticated strategies, segmentation, risk resilience, and so forth, with lots of scenario support, lots of analytical support. And I think critically, uh, the democratization that I talked about earlier is something Cisco's been uh, working with for a long time. They want to try to bring everybody into the game. Uh, there's expertise out there in many different flavors. And provided that the tools are on the table, Cisco believes that those people can bring something to the party. They're not trying to solve a single problem. They're trying to solve multiple problems all simultaneously. That concurrency image I had up a moment ago, I think, really addresses the way that Cisco thinks about things. Now, why not is the question. So why can't we simply have these three big, powerful tools interacting in the, uh, in the flow of planning? Simulation, democratized decision making, and um, you know the, the, the power of the historian, they really come together into a completely different approach to planning. I'm going to circle back just, just verbally here for a sec to the digital technologies that I said were so disruptive. If I put big data analytics into this equation and the kind of power of processors that, have, uh, that is, is now readily available, now suddenly simulation goes from being something that was really unwieldy to being something that's possible. If I say, let's throw cloud into this, or digital supply chain, or Internet of Things with more information flowing. That means democratize decision making that much more realistic. And if I start saying that I've got cloud access to massive stored files, why wouldn't the historian be equally realistic? Why not is the question. If you're trying to think of a planning solution and you've got these kinds of capabilities increasingly realistic, why not rethink the entire approach to sales and operations planning? This is a little bit along the lines of what Amgen had done and, and made some decisions to go down this road. The story behind Amgen very quickly, regulations, all right, we're talking biotech here, very widely. You have local, you have site level, you have regional or country, you have global regs. So you've got various different conditions that need to be thought about. In order to try to do the planning about the what ifs that are out there across all these different possible um, cuts of the Amgen business universe, it was necessary to be able to go back and forth, toggle, if you like, between a global plan and then a regional plan, or maybe a site-specific plan. What that really is looking for <clears throat> is kind of like what I said a minute ago. I want the what if. I want the heavy simulation. I want the democratized decision making. I want all of my experts in the field part of this process. And I want to keep track of what, um, what it is we've done in the historian. What they've done, of course, is they've used the cloud technology as a support to sit this thing on top of their ERP system and begin to access some of these highly variable approaches to planning. So Amgen was really approaching this with that same kind of why not mentality. Could we break the old habits? And finally, NCR, I'm going to talk about these guys. It's a very similar fundamental logic. 
multiple scenarios, in this case very focused on things like logistics and international trade, a lot of knowledge about what can and cannot work, what is the most effective or efficient or reliable method for dealing with a particularly logistics problem is actually at the local level. It's in the execution level. So in specific cases, it's often true that those who are closest to the final point of delivery, those who are handling finished goods or, in this case, let's say service parts, and know exactly what's on hand and exactly what the um, logistics challenges are. They mean traffic challenges. They may be access challenges. Uh, those folks have a lot of knowledge. To be able to run scenarios that are global enough to be able to do what is this SNOP mandate of balancing supply and demand, <clears throat> but take account of the local observations that are possible at an execution level, suddenly you have the ability to do um, a whole lot more detailed, specific, real-world thinking about this. So hearkening back to everybody that I've gone through so far, the Honeywell case, the Cisco case, the Amgen case, and now NCR, different ways of looking at your universe uh, in terms of the folks who make up your supply chain and what they bring to the planning party, whether it's geographic or it's um, strategic, whether it's customer level, um, all those players bring something to the party. So this concurrency concept allows them to participate in the decisions, not just at an execution level doing the work, but at a planning level, including that execution level knowledge up into the decisions that get made in the first place. And this final slide is not really a breakdown of VIA's use case per se, but we took this as a proof point uh, because Avaya's this is their own graphic. Avaya's view of the world is they want to rise up this arrow, value of time invested. They want to make more of the time they put into their planning process. And this kind of is a, is a pretty firm attack on sales and operations planning. The low value added pyramid on the left is the one in which you collect lots and lots of data, you try to turn it into information, you try to contextualize it, and you present it as knowledge. This is, uh, spoken I guess most harshly, is the reality of people pulling stuff out of their various different ERP systems and planning systems and sourcing systems and customer forecast systems, trying to get information out of the raw data, trying to contextualize it so you go from um, an enterprise system up into some kind of a spreadsheet where you digest the information, you contextualize it, probably with a PowerPoint, and you bring it into a meeting. And then knowledge arises. So you're working so hard at the bottom of the pyramid just to have the right information on the table to make a good business decision. Avaya says, you know what, let's flip this. Let's focus much less time on the basic tasks. Let's focus more as we rise up this inverted pyramid on the data trends that we see, even more on the causal understanding so we know why certain things are happening, and at the very top, some kind of prediction, some sort of innovation, the ability to basically balance your optimization initiatives against the benefits of all parties concerned. So you're minimizing the workload at the base and maximizing this, the decision process. The most engagement possible, the most information possible, and really the most value possible. It's a really interesting way to think about inverting the whole concept of sales and operations planning. Now, one specific example that is worth thinking about, this is from research that was done by Stanford Business School. Uh, Howley and a, a bunch of folks were brought on by the United States Postal Service to try to figure out last mile logistics. The reason we pulled this particular chart is that you've got really so much going on here. On the horizontal axis, you see the near term, the medium term, the longer term stretching out into the years. Then you see different slices of the geographic uh, service area that you're trying to focus on from a last mile logistics perspective. You've got remote locations. You've got the small towns. You've got suburbs of the big cities and the dense urban areas. In the near term, what they found when they did this research with the Postal Service was algorithms and analytics were really going to make a big difference in terms of deciding how to best serve, from a last mile standpoint, each of these different areas. But as they rolled out further in time, the problem becomes a lot more complex. You see drones and robots entering the scene in the two to five year horizon. And five years out, we're talking about driverless vehicles everywhere, from 
the most downtown location all the way down to uh, an RGV, if you like, going 300 miles off the grid in, you know, Alberta to deliver something. How do you plan this? When do you make a decision about this? When do you say, yeah, we're going to start using drones? Or um, where are we going to start with robots? Is it initially just going to be in the remote locations? And when do we bring these things on? To try to tackle a problem of this complexity and to do so with something other than that classic long-term high-value strategic planning approach is almost impossible without more of the inputs, more of the simulation, more of the what-ifs, more of the different perspectives. What are the various people who are currently doing last mile in each of these different slices of the, the geographic pie? And what's really going to happen? in the near, medium, and long term. The need to replan this with lots of analytics and lots of inputs from different expertise, and then lots of history of what we've learned, is enormous. This is not something that's just going to be a matter of supply-demand balancing. This is a matter of decisions and timing of decisions. So it's really a great example of the kind of problem that benefits from this. So if you like any of the sound of moving from SNOP as this very scheduled decision-making process um, to something that's a lot more dynamic, a lot more active, a lot more continuous. Here's a six-point action plan. Start off by determining what's possible versus what's just possible now. This is a, a journey. People say SNOP is a journey. So is concurrency. It's a matter of making the right decisions about how you want to move. Answer the right questions as a leadership team. What are we really trying to get at? Just because you have all sorts of capabilities doesn't mean you want to answer all sorts of questions. It's a bit of a prioritization that needs to go on. Scenario planning, I've talked about it ad nauseum. An analyst who can build scenarios using the data is a critical piece of the puzzle. And someone who can explain those scenarios is a critical piece of the puzzle. It's not just the math. It's also the explanation of how that scenario works. Fourth, you'll see dedicate time to review what actually happened. It's sort of like the historian concept. If you have the historian and you're capturing your um, test drives, your, your experiments, your learning process, you've got to take a look back and see the actuals that arose from the plan. This is something that's a good discipline that one should use in any supply chain context. But to go down the road of concurrency, you lose a big chunk of the value if you don't review what actually happened. Make your technology roadmap visual. Absolutely. Technology is out of hand in some ways. Back in the day, in the 90s and the early 2000s, the technology roadmap was roll out your ERP system, go live on some distant date in the future, and assume everything's going to be fine. It's not like that anymore. Are you going to deal with drones? Are you going to have robotics? Are you going to have remotely guided vehicles? That's part of your tech roadmap. What about the democratization of planning that I talked about? Who gets access? And how do you control that access? And who has a chance to participate? These kinds of things are part of thinking about where you're going to put technology in place and how it's going to fit to the as-is universe. We think of it in terms of demand sense and supply sense, but also demand response and supply response. Where does all this stuff sit, and how do you enable it, especially in the middle, where you want to make decisions and commitments? So that visual roadmap is critical to that. And finally, catalog your planning library across functions. People think of planning differently. It's one thing to plan a promotion. It's another thing to plan production. It's another thing to plan capital expansions. If you look at it this way, functionally, you'll see relevance attaches to, let's say, these functional roles, demand, planning, procurement, manufacturing, and so forth. And the kinds of shorter execution level or longer strategic level planning horizons you need to think about. Spend analytics is one version, as are spot buys. Capacity planning is the strategic version of day-to-day -day production scheduling. So these kinds of definitions are critical to making it all work. You've got to keep it relevant for the team if you want this six-point plan to happen. Now, I'm closing in on the end here, and I'm, I'm aware, uh, Trevor, that we have some questions. But I also want to make sure that folks who want access to this material um, have a chance to get it. And you'll see on Canaxis's website right down, right there at the, uh, at the link, is a place to pull down this particular report. Um, Backing up one step to the opening comments that Melissa and uh, Trevor set us off with, the idea here is things are changing. And this is a path forward. It's a different way of thinking about planning. The technology makes it possible. 
the pace at which things are happening makes it necessary. So I would argue this is a, a worthwhile report to take a look at and think about your own approach to planning as you move forward. So Trevor, I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind just to spend a couple of minutes talking us through this slide and make sure that folks have a perspective on um, concurrency as you guys see it over at Canaxis. Do you want to just um, take the ball from here and have me uh, yes. transfer the slides? I've got some I've got control. Thank you very much, thank Kevin. You. Yes, and thank you very much for uh, that presentation. This thing I couldn't help but uh, consider when you were talking about the two diagrams of the local and the global kind of uh, uh, coming together, going back to the 1960s thought of think global, act local, uh, and how it actually brings those two things together. And in, in particularly in the context of Jake Barr's comment about those two things working simultaneously. And uh, was wondering just quickly before I move on is, you know, there was one verb maybe or one characterization uh, that uh, came to mind when you were talking about the concurrency and uh, the manner in which it would be used to help people make similar decisions as in SNOP, and that's perpetual. Yeah. Uh, you know that it's, it's not a sequence thing. It's perpetual. It's always available was one of the ideas, right? Yeah, and you know, I said it really only once, scheduled decision making. Mm. <clears throat> mm. That's what we're trying to get away from here. You want mm. to get to perpetual. Perpetual is mm. valuable because the problems never stop. You know, <clears throat> in the report, we talk about scheduled decision making as uh, a legacy of that planning construct that we talked about up front where you can do short-term, uh, <clears throat> low-impact, or long-term high-impact decisions. Therefore, you end up scheduling this cadence-driven sales and operations planning process. Uh, it's not really like that. The real world is, is constant. The real world is perpetual. Uh, and whether a challenge comes up and you need to deal with it right this second, or you've got um, something in terms of a warning and you can get yourself organized for it, you never really want to disband the ability to plan. So I think perpetual, I'm glad you, you pulled that uh, as, a, as a thought, Trevor. Perpetual planning is really where we're headed. Uh, mm -hmm. the scheduled decision making is a legacy of the past. When things move more slowly and information was very difficult to, to get your hands on, both of those things have changed. And so we have to be in a mode of continuous, perpetual if you like, yeah. planning. Yes, excellent. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to share some observations from my own experience of working in the space for many years as well. And uh, really, you know, reading the paper, the thing that came to mind for me is about how concurrency is so dependent on the ability to be able to connect the data process and people, because essentially that's uh, what is all required to pull it all together. And if we just think about it, that in the digital age, um, you know, this is a, a diagram that I just found on the internet that is referring to the digital supply chain. And this, the diagram just neatly lays out those uh, breaking points. And if we think about that in the sort of analog, and I use uh, double quotes deliberately because, you know, we've, we've been using computers to do planning for many years but it was in a sort of slide rule mentality, if we like. Uh, but the analog world, you know, the data exists in, in ERP systems, uh, other planning systems, et cetera, and even, you know, separate demand planning solutions. So largely fairly uh, disconnected and many times isolated data pools. And uh, when we see many companies that have grown through acquisition or trading partners and trading networks, uh, Cisco comes to mind, um, then there's a great need to be able to connect the data across those data pools. And then we see below that is the sort of traditional description of all of the planning processes that we've known uh, over many uh, last 40 years, I guess, is really the description of that, uh, the ideas um, described and perpetuated by the likes of Apex, and, you know, lots of good things come from that. But the scheduling, the production planning, uh, all of the demand planning ideas, DRP, et cetera, are well described within that environment. And at the bottom is really the hierarchical organization in which we actually operate with all of the silo decision-making 
and which then leads to that uh, stepwise decision making because you need to uh, escalate within your own environment before the decision gets actually passed over or the, uh, the data gets passed over to the next organization, which then first cascades down and cascades up. And we find that uh, these are some of the things that people are really struggling with to try and overcome. But then when we talk about digital and where that's driving this whole decision process, is that the data is not necessarily going to reside entirely within the organization. And in fact, many times it might be coming from sensors external to the organization, but equally it could be coming from uh, the robots, et cetera, that are working within your organization. And then uh, adding to that is the machine intelligence and artificial intelligence that's actually absorbing that information and making some level of automated decision making on, on top of that. Now, when you talk about the historian, this is a good place to start because what better way of learning how to plan in the future than actually having a history of what you've done in the past and understanding what's worked and what hasn't worked. So that's the first stepping stone and then build it upon that to be able to uh, improve on those decisions. And lastly is the people. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer anyway that people are still going to be a key part of the supply chain. Undoubtedly, from the very early stages of MRP and, and the descriptions around uh, blue material explosions and all of this, you know, we've moved a long way from the old planning boards uh, to some level of digital representation of all of that decision making. And this is a continuum of that where people are still going to be involved. You're still going to have trading partners who have different objectives who need to uh, come to a joint des uh, decision across competing metrics that is not necessarily going to be made uh, automatically by a machine. So it's about how do you bring all of those people together to achieve that democratized decision making? Because this is where they share ideas, where they test ideas in the, in the simulation, and uh, therefore they uh, capture all of the information about how they uh, made a decision in the historian and bring this all together. Now, to your six-point plan, um, you know, this is going to be a, a matter of migration. Uh, this is not going to be a, uh, a big shift in a very short period of time. People are going to need to migrate to this uh, way of decision making over a period of time, and therefore we are going to live in the analog and digital world for some period of time. But you've gave, given them some good steps on how to move forward. And really, when we bring it all together from uh, our perspective anyway, uh, you know, rapid response is the tool that we provide, and it sits in the middle there connecting the data process and people. Uh, but in the surround, it's all with the uh, supply chain working. And it's when you bring these three things together, uh, these capabilities that you then have the ability to perform current planning. And of course, then, if we wrap that all up on the, on the outside, when you're talking about the process capabilities and approaches, then we are talking about the simulation, the historian, and the democratized decision making, all being enabled by a key technology such as this. So um, that's you know the termination from my side. But I do believe we've got a number of questions, Melissa, that have been stacked up. Um, and we'd like to then hand or ask uh, Kevin to be a key part in answering those questions. That's right. We do have, we've had some really great questions come through. Um, if you do have a question, now is the time to ask. You can use the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so let's get started with the first question. Kevin, Trevor, what is the fundamental need for concurrency? We can start with you, Kevin. Well, I think the fundamental need, uh, a lot of it was reflected in Trevor's last set of slides. It's about trying to break down these silos and trying to break down these time horizons. Um, the scheduled decision making as a was, and the perpetual decision making as an is, um, really include cross-functional thinking and without quite so much time involved. I think time is really the most important thing of all in the, uh, in the path forward of breaking down these silos and including all these different kinds of, of inputs. I don't know. I feel like the situation is very different now than it would have been even five years ago. You know, these disruptive technologies are in many cases quite new, not all of them, but um, 
but those are the things that are, are critical. Yeah. Trevor, I don't know if your perspective yeah, I, differs at all. Yeah. No, I, I agree, Kevin. I mean, we always uh, stand on the shoulders of giants. So this isn't about throwing everything away that we've learned, but a new way of actually operating in that environment. Um, you know, we do come from a time when, in fact, all of the decisions had to be made in silos because it was only a certain amount of information that an individual could absorb and calculate at any one time. And even as we look at the technologies, that were available at the time that most of our processes uh, that we know and love uh, were defined, the, it just wasn't possible to absorb that quantity of information, actually perform calculations on, those, uh, on that vast quantity of data. And as a consequence, we did silo the processes. But now those barriers have moved away. So from a technology perspective, now we need to move them away or remove them from a process perspective and a way of thinking and uh, reorganize our, our, our processes and organizational structures to take that in, in mind. And this is the beginning of that process. Good. The next question that was asked is, how can I show the process winnings? I'm always questioned by quantitative data, but for me, planning gains are more subjective. Trevor, let's start with you. Yeah, that is a, a very interesting question. So, um, you know, I can only hark back to a lesson I learned from somebody who was a very senior person in the firefighting department in Los Angeles, who told me that uh, the two determinants of the scale of a disaster are the time it takes you to know that you've got a fire and the time it takes you to put it out. So if we put it into that context, then being able to make a decision more quickly well, first of all, understanding that something has changed that is of material importance is extremely important. Being able to act on that information very quickly is of, of the second most importance. So in that context, being able to make a decision very quickly is, of course, a very important capability. Now, I would never be the one to say that just because you've got a piece of information, you need to change your mind. Uh, that's not the whole point about concurrency and that we have been discussing. The point is that you are aware of a change that has occurred that has a material impact on your supply chain. Those are two important words, aware and material. And once you, are, uh, you have established those two things, it's a conscious decision then on what you do. So we're not necessarily suggesting that there will be a great deal of churn and disruption in the supply chain but at least you make a conscious decision before the fact as opposed to after the fact. And I think this is where we will then see tangible financial benefits, inventory reduction, customer service improvements uh, come from the ability to make decisions more quickly and be more aware of changes in the supply chain. Kevin, any thoughts? Yeah, one thought, and you know, I'm, to be honest, I'm scrolling ahead and looking at some of the questions, and they're, they're making me smile at some really interesting ones about Unintended consequences. I don't want to jump, Melissa, but I know we're kind of going there. Um, <clears throat> the value, if you stay focused on um, traditional metrics, inventory, you're probably going to get some, but that's not going to be earth shattering. I think the value is going to come from, there's something I remember seeing, perishable demand. I remember Dem uh, Dell talking about this years ago. If you do concurrency well, if you can kind of live the full vision here, and by the way, it's, it's a journey, as Trevor said, I think the kinds of things you're going to see um, payback on are more business, essentially. I mean, perishable demand means somebody who would have bought the product but or would have taken the order would have you know, been a customer, but the moment passed and the, the bid wasn't acceptable and they moved on. So perishable demand means grabbing that piece of business you couldn't otherwise get. Yes, inventory should be leaner. Yes, service levels should be better. But I think, remember I talked about segmentation at Cisco. That's a strategy that we see in a lot of supply chains. If you're going to have segmented supply chains, you're going to have different paths to market for a delivery or for a product. And you want to be able to accommodate as many as the business can handle, you know, four or five, six different supply chains. If you don't have some kind of a technique for dealing with all of this information, you're going to miss orders. I would prefer to measure this stuff in the agility of the business, which probably at its most impactful is business we would have missed but we didn't. Mm -hmm. I still think Trevor's right on about uh, the classic 
money saving opportunities, service level performance opportunities. You've got to track that where you can. But this is about enabling a different kind of supply chain, one that's more agile, one that grabs business that otherwise would get lost. So I feel like that's a little bit the way mm -hmm. to think about it. Yeah, I, I agree, Kevin. I, I really like that one, your response to that one. It is about being able to be the early bird, right, that catches the worm. Uh, yeah, yeah. To use an idiom, yeah. Well, you want to be say, able to promise. I mean, one of the things I'm going too far with this, hmm. you want to be able to say, yeah, we'll take that order and we'll expedite it, and no that at least you've run it through the simulation, you've had to think about it, mm. and you feel good about the chances that it's it's going to pay off. You know the old strategic customer always gets special service? Mm -hmm. A lot of people discover at the end of the year, not even the end of the quarter, that that strategic customer has been losing you money all along because you're expediting everything. This should help you to not do that. That's not quite the same as perishable demand. That's foregone margin. But you want to be able to uh, be flexible in the way you respond and say yes, without just giving it away. And that's what this looks to me like it enables. Again, it's uh, that term I used before, conscious decision making. You're aware yeah. of the consequences, and therefore you make a conscious decision to act in a certain manner. Exactly. And in your particular case, it might be a conscious decision to at times not service that strategic customer at a loss. Uh, because, and or, you know, which then maybe in the longer term leads to the uh, negotiation with that strategic customer on how you can actually become more profitable in servicing them. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so we've had a lot of questions come in, so I hope we can get to them all, but um, I'll ask the next one. Um, will perpetual planning be a formal cross-functional process like SNOP? What should the cadence look like? Yes, no, we Go ahead, Trevor, sorry. No, I, th I think that's one for you, Kevin, to start. <laughs> I think the answer is yes. I mean, and in fact, that's one of the, again, I scrolled ahead and look at some of the questions. It's true. This is complicated. Yeah, it's going to have to be sort of like what Trevor said. We're not throwing everything away. SNOP is perpetual, you know, it, it's something people have always cared about because it actually does work reasonably well. I showed you all that negative stuff, necessary evil. Um, concurrency has to be a cross-functional process. It's probably the biggest challenge. You know, I mean, Trevor and I just sort of stumbled all over ourselves trying to think of good metrics. A really good metric here is incremental margin contribution. But that's very hard to measure, and it's incredibly cross-functional. So the commercial side of your business has to be engaged in a process where they don't just discount or give away, or where they take extra money off the table if they can. and the supply side of your business, whether you're talking the logistics people who, who are going to be jumping through hoops to deliver, or the production people who are going to be trying to keep unit costs down, these things always involve compromises. They're inherently cross-functional. The main thing that I like about this is all those trade-offs, people have a pretty good sense about anyhow. Everybody knows that if you um, you know, make certain decisions in the way you pack an order, it's going to be more efficient. But then again, somebody's going to have to wait. Sometimes that's fine for everybody. Most systems can't handle that. SNOP finesses it by people talking about it offline, around the table. This should allow you to keep track of it and say, were we right to consistently overserve that particular customer? Did they buy more from us over the course of the year because of it? It's deeply cross-functional, very challenging, and I think that concurrency takes SNOP, frankly, up a level to a kind of planning that is that is even more connected. So it's a bit yeah. ambitious, but I also think it's the, the only way forward. And I think, uh, Kevin, there's you know some of the the issues that people are struggling with is many of these um, uh, activities right now are highly manual. Uh, in order to do some of these analysis, you've got to pull data from multiple systems, put it in a spreadsheet, run something specific, and come up with a conclusion about what your net margin contribution is. Because there's nothing that provides it to you um, on the go, right when you're about to make a decision, and you say, if I did this, what would be my change in net margin contribution? And by the way, who else would I be impacting? These are things that people are not accustomed to seeing in their uh, current decision making. And as a consequence, it seems like a great leap forward. But this is where the technology comes in to assist. 
And I couldn't help listening to what you were saying there, for example, the, the words like trade-off. Uh, in fact, uh, I learned something from a great guy, Yves Morio at BCG. He said, uh, you know, collaboration is easy. Uh, cooperation is difficult because cooperation is when there's an, a natural imbalance between the decisions that you're trying to make. And what he means by that is there's a trade-off that's required. Uh, and that is where the difficult decisions really get made because it is then about the fact that maybe you are going to um, provide less customer service because you need to focus on net margin contribution. So it is about uh, making those difficult trade-offs and it, that is about having the data available to you and served up to you so that you understand what the consequences of your decisions are before you actually make them. So the next question we were asked, um, based on your market understanding, what, percent of, what percentage of organizations have started concurrent planning? Is there, in a company that's extremely siloed, how could Canaxis help democratize the, the organization and how would a supply chain manager sell this proposal? Because Sounds like one for you, Trevor. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. Selling the proposal, um, you know, it is about actually uh, showing people what is possible. And uh, that is, of course, highly related to how many people are actually on this journey. So, you know, how many people are on this journey, they don't necessarily call it concurrent planning. But I've got to say that nearly every time I walk into an organization to discuss the um, possibility of deploying uh, can access and rapid response, the question is usually around how do we get the organization to actually um, see end-to-end -end and actually act end-to-end. -end. They might not state it in that manner. That's usually a statement about problems. Um, it takes us too long to pull the data together. Uh, we've got data in multiple ERP systems, and it, it's not consistent. Um, the the uh, Europeans don't plan in the same cadence as we do in the US. These are all statements about the impact of not having concurrency. And as a consequence, I see, you know, my statement would be that there, there are probably 5% of companies that have actually started on this journey, but there are 100% of the companies that actually understand the need to start on this journey. They don't necessarily have the um, the knowledge and, and capabilities to start on the journey, but this is part of why we have in the webinar and why I think this paper that SEM World has written is so important because it lays out the art of the possible in terms of organizational structure and process. Yeah, if I can just offer one little thought on that because <clears throat> I'm going to echo one thing in there in particular. 5%? Yeah, that's probably about right. So it's kind of on the cutting edge side here. If, however, you ask me what percent of senior supply chain executives oh. want to see something like this happen and kind of a walking around thinking this should be possible, we're talking about more than 50%. Only the most cynical SVPs believe that this is too difficult or cross-functional stuff is just too hard to really force or the technology is not ready. They don't believe that. They know it's going to take a while but they expect us to figure it out. I think if you're someone who's just dealing with SNOP and, you know, preaching SNOP, you see the, the, the mountain from the bottom and it looks like a long way. If you're at the top and you're looking down at your SNOP org, you think, you know what, philosophically it's right, but it's slow. The data's not good. I can't really see what my options are. I end up having to back channel this and make phone calls. And the thought is, from the top of the mountain, this should be better. This has got mm. to get better. So I think that the percentage of those who are doing it is very low, like you said, Trevor. But I think the percentage who expect it is very high. Yep. I would agree. Yep. Okay, well, Melissa? it looks actually like we've run out of time. Um, for those that we didn't get a chance to answer your question, we'll reach out to you after the webcast. Um, but I really want to thank you both, Kevin uh, Omara and Trevor Miles, for the great webcast today and everyone for joining us. As a reminder, we will be sharing the recording and the presentation slides in the next day or two, next day or two so stay tuned. Thanks, guys.
Bye now. Bye now.